Good evening. My name is John Sopel, and I'm delighted to welcome you uh, this evening to this Ytree event in partnership with Intelligence Squared. Uh, Ytree was founded in 2017 to give clients insight, advice about money and life itself. Ytree calls this insight financial life intelligence. And the, at the heart of the idea is um, how do you define wealth? Is it defined by how you live or what you have? And that's where Futureverse comes in. And the Futureverse is where Whitery brings together ideas, conversations, insights like this and about the one we're about to have around our community's passions and problems. And tonight is the second uh, live event in the Futureverse series. Uh, the first was a debate about life, whether life was going to be better in five years, 50 years or 500 years. And that is real futurology guessing to estimate what life will be like in uh, 500 years. And it was a fascinating discussion with Sir Anthony Gormley, who I don't know, as a result of that discussion, decided he was going to move out of the United Kingdom. Uh, Mo Gowda <laughs> and uh, the environmentalist Clover Hogan. Tonight's event will feature uh, on the central theme of the future first, the value revolution and the subject and title of this evening's uh, conversation is reimagining worth. Uh, we're going to be focusing on how the definition of value has changed in recent times, and we'll be exploring the different ways society dies, decides what things are worth. For example, how much is it worth to have a stable government, for example, which seems a <laughs> timely reference. Um, how do we define value? How has the value this changed over time? And who has a say over what is deemed valuable or worthless? In broad terms, there's been a global consensus about what constitutes value ever since the Industrial Revolution. Products and services could be exchanged for money, which could in turn pay for other products and services. But we're now in an era of disruption. So has the definition of value itself expanded to mean more than economic value? Health, our relationships with those around us and preserving our planet, all of these things are, as if not more important than the number in our bank account. And this event will explore the recent changes in how we perceive and understand value. Simon, let me start with you. You've exper experienced the financial world during your time at Morgan Stanley and now Rothschild, and your career as I guess centered around what has value for investors, for clients, for companies. Have you seen over the last two or three decades big shifts in how value is assessed? <clears throat> so I think that one's prism for examination is almost always too short term. And the financial services industry is extraordinarily guilty. You can pick up an analyst report or a commentator will say, well, yes, yeah, amazing. It's the cheapest it's been in 10 years. That really isn't very helpful, particularly if you've lived in a liquidity fueled central bank in a manipulated environment where they've fire hosed every crisis since Y2K in a, what I would consider to be an inexcusable way for which we are paying the price with this inflation and the, and the instabilities beyond you know, Ukraine. So it's only when you put things in a proper historical context that you can understand whether something may or may not be cheap. And I'm conscious that we're in a world where things are changing very rapidly in terms of uh, disintermediation, in terms of obsolescence. I mean, you, with FTSE 100 oil, S&P companies have never had a shorter existence. And, uh, uh, and you know, CEOs are now running companies and they're older and the companies are dying before then. So I think that if you take, for example, and I'm going to give you some slightly, uh, you know, um, abstruse examples, uranium. How do you solve the big energy crisis where many have naively thought you could do it in speed without cost, yet nuclear is part of the solution? Then you look at the uranium price, you say, where's it been over the last 40 years? How did it go from, you know, how did it have an 80% bear market, top to bottom? Does it feature? Then you can contextualize it, look at it five years. Then you can add in other factors that may or may not change. And so really the prism through which I approach value as an investor is to be able to try and understand what an asset has been worth in the past, what it might be worth, and you have to relate that to something in a company. It might be price to book, it might be price to dividend yields, price to revenues. Um, but in other situations, even currencies, you can use well-known tools to try and understand whether something is cheap or expensive, and underlying it is the human frailty that likes things are bright. People like things that are new, sexy, and shiny, and they tend to disregard stuff as old, and people buy and buy, and they get super excited, and then what follows is disappointment and despair. 
And therein lies the opportunity for investors to buy up stuff that has often been discarded and unloved. And one of the big changes that we've seen in the finance industry is the growth and the significance and the power of private equity. Can you talk about how that plays itself out? Well, I would not claim um, to have any great insights into private equity, but we've been very lucky in the podcast. We are in the process of releasing five episodes from the top you know, the top firms from you know, KKR to CDR, et cetera. And two things have struck me. One is the quality of the people running these firms. And having been at what was considered to be, and it was a well-managed firm, Morgan Stanley, for nearly 20 years, I think that some of the management teams I've met at these private equity firms are really good and robust. And, you know, although there'll be fractures and dislocations and problems coming out of what could be a very painful period for some time, some of these are going to come out stronger. They'll be the restructurers. They'll be the owners of assets. And I think they'll be bigger firms. That was observation number one. And observation number two, which comes nicely back to, to, you know, to value, is you know, people talk about markets are expensive. Well, the US stock market has been and remains expensive by historical standards. The UK stock market is cheap by historical standards. In fact, 40, it's, it's as cheap as it's been in 40 years relative to other markets for reasons that you know, we can go into maybe be perfectly logical. But you know, they are therefore quite focused on where the value is. And that's why a lot of private equity equity activity has been and will continue to be on UK assets. So what is the future of uh, private equity? Uh, does its growth signify a shift in the way that individuals and companies are investing? I think one of the problems, public markets have not served investors well. You know, you've had a reduction in the number of companies that are listed, a reduction in the number of companies that are researched. Um, if, you're a, if you're an owner of a private business and you're thinking, what do I do? I'm ready to sell it. Your options were listing or staying private for years. And now it's, do I want to sell it to a competitor? Okay, that was there before. But do I want to sell to a private equity firm and essentially replace my shareholders with permanent capital? So I think that they are here to stay. This is not even given cheap money has created distortions in the way things operate. A private equity are here to stay. And I think that the strong ones will emerge as very significant financial organizations. And Every company that I seem to speak to, they've appointed an ESG officer, uh, environmental, social, and governance. Um, I wonder what you think of the significances of this. A company's value used to be linked by its return on investment or its share price or whatever other metric you wanted to use to talk about how well it was doing. And I've been living in America for the last seven years and just recently come back and saw there that, you know, companies at the business roundtable were talking increasingly about the importance of ESG issues. Now, is this for the long term? Peter Harrison, who's the CEO of Schroeder, said in 10 years we won't talk about ESG. It'll be simply be part of the process. Is that, you know, when you evaluate a company's governance and their social standards and you know, environmental footprint, you know, it's just it's just part of the research. So I think to a certain extent that's you know it's good practice. Good firms will tell you they've been doing that for a while. On the other hand, the zealots have got hold of ESG, and I think that in doing so, what would you do? Defined as a zealot. I, I would describe people who are evangelical in a mix of my religious metaphors. I think sometimes they are e evangelical to the point of not being realistic. We can come back with and discuss energy. I think that's sort of a, you know a really good example of what happens when you force an agenda. What is the byproduct? Companies don't invest in energy, and now we're opening coal plants up again. Well, okay. Well, let's let's stick with energy. Um, my question to you really is about uh, you look at Russia, Ukraine. And you've seen a surge in oil prices as a result of it. Is that a good place to invest or a bad place to invest? Is it good to invest in coal now or a bad place to invest in coal? So I think there's a very important distinction. I don't think anybody that I'm aware of who's re relatively sort of sound of mind would argue that the damage to the planet and the requirement for changes of behavior are paramount. I think my frustration comes in the naive lens that has been overlaid that in execution. And this is simply about if you want to get from where we are to where we must get, how do you do it effectively? And if you discourage some of the very people who can help you in that transition from investing, then you cause bottlenecks and shortages, and then you drive up the prices of all sorts of things, and you have unintended consequences. But what do you do when someone says, you know, should I invest ethically or should I invest to get the maximum return on my capital? So everybody will, different answers. My answer about a company like Shell for example. Now, Shell 
some people won't buy Shell and BP because they consider them to be, you know, the evil giant. It's interesting that Nikolai Tangen, who runs the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, who is the first to really march down this sort of road of being ethically aware, post on their website the companies from which they have divested. BP is not one of them. In fact, he's done a very interesting interview with Bernard Looney of BP. Because if you are BP or Shell and you're spending 20 million plus in the transition yourself towards electrification, those are the folks with the balance sheets to get it done. So starving them of capital and divesting where it goes to passive investing is not, in my opinion, a very helpful route to get to where we need to, which is not in doubt. Okay, Simon, we're going to leave it there for a moment. I want you guys to do a bit of work. Um, what do you all think about ESG? Um, you have one minute to <laughs> answer the poll that should be on the screen now. So, okay, fascinating. Um, is ESG mainly an exercise in greenwashing? You're leaning over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 17% of, of you say yes. 50% of you say no. Undecided, exactly a third. So, fascinating. Adrian, let me come to you. Your book, The Value of a Whale, um, is focused where I think I could guess where you would vote on the illusions of green capitalism. So I'm sure you have a lot to say about what Simon has just said, but let's do, talk about the books, which is about you know, the response of society to the climate crisis, um, which, as you say, also argue, has been created through a very narrow economic lens. Why do you think human beings are so determined to ascribe economic value to things but what does it say about the, you know, the way we see the world? Yeah, an interesting question. So I think in the book opens with an example of this. So recently, a team of researchers at the IMF um, undertook an exercise to try and place a valuation on whales, great whales as a species, um, and based on sort of a series of criteria like their ecotourism services or the amount of carbon that they're capable of sequestering over their lifetimes, arrives at the very tidy sum of two million US dollars per great whale, or about one trillion per the global stock. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting provocation, provocation for me about the way that uh, we're approaching our response to the climate and ecological crisis, which thus far has been really dominated by the idea that really the only way to grapple with these challenges is to sort of internalize the cost of these damages to the market. So the idea that the climate crisis is the ultimate market failure and the same goes for biodiversity collapse and therefore applying sort of a price or a value to the damages that we're creating or to the species themselves is sort of a mechanism that will then inevitably enable the market to sort of right those wrongs. Um, and I think, you know, that to me reflects slightly sort of narrow-minded or myopic thinking. I think markets are good at some things. Um, but when it comes to the sort of immense complexity and the, you know, systemic embeddedness of fossil fuels within our society and our lives, you know, Simon touched on that, it's not quite so simple as just starving a couple companies of capital. Um, I think, you know, it's a much more complex question than simply applying a price to it. But we have sort of a society that's really based around, you know, economic value as the primary, you know, source of value in our lives. Um, and anything that doesn't have a dollar value assigned to it or for which a dollar value can't be assigned tends to be excluded from the types of decisions that we make, but also principally when it comes to the climate crisis that, you know, policymakers make. Everything has to have sort of an economic justification. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's fine in some regards, but when it comes to, a, you know, a genuinely non-trivial risk of catastrophic ecological outcomes, um, it probably shouldn't, from my view, be, be the priority. Right, fascinating. You thought you were going to have a relaxing evening. In fact, you're going to work quite hard now because we've got another <laughs> poll uh, to see what the audience thinks. And you have uh, one minute, um, which is the only way humans can understand value is by attaching a price to it. True or false? Once we've seen the poll, I would like to tell you what I teach my GCSE economic students on um, value, worth and price. Is, is, that, is that appropriate at this point? Right. Okay, and this comes up on the syllabus. What is the difference between value and price? Price is determined by supply and demand. It is an objective number. The very term value is not an objective number, and it has 
the value judgment, as we econo uh, economists call it, embedded in it. It is a subjective measure that reflects our preferences. The two are completely different things, and so I would just like to make that straight at this point in the evening. Thank you. That was a statement from Lucy Kelly. Coming to the results now. Um, so, the question was, um, the only way humans can understand value is by attaching a price to it, true or false, True, 35%. False, 65%. So, Adrian, let me stay with you. Why do you think that the environment is so often presented as an issue to be seen through the prism of economic terms? And why is that a bad thing? Is it not helpful to provide numbers? Well, I can't really climb inside everybody's head, so I might avoid speculating on why that is. But I think I'll speak to why I think in the context of addressing this crisis, it's it's a problem. Um, and, you know, a big part of the way, again, that, you know, we're approaching climate and environmental policy is through prioritizing cost efficiency. So one of the most famous sort of environmental and climate economists is uh, William Nordhaus. Many people might be familiar with his work. Uh, and he describes, you know, cost efficiency in the context of climate economics as sort of, you know, the breakfast, lunch and dinner of economists and, and the way that we're resolving this problem and therefore, you know, market-based mechanisms as the most efficient way to address uh, an ecological crisis. And again, that might be true in a situation in which you had an infinite time horizon ahead of you. Um, but for me, the reality of the pace, scale, and complexity of the challenge that we're facing, you know, means that... A you know, appraising what we need to do purely through, is this cost efficient, is this cost effective, um, is just going to end up in a position of potentially, you know, catastrophic ecological outcomes. Now, maybe that's a naive perspective to take um, from the perspective of some people in this room, but I think it's sort of a necessary corrective for us to, you know, think about what it is actually that we're trying to do, which is to prevent a potentially catastrophic ecological outcome, start from there, and then, you know, have cost effectiveness and efficiency as a consideration, uh, you know, farther down the table. But isn't ESG a good thing in that it is encouraging companies to invest more ethically, to be more conscious uh, of the environment, even if the, the goal of profit is still there? Yeah, so I think, I mean, for me, what's interesting about ESG is that I find that it's, um, it indicates what I think to be a very encouraging shift in public perspective. So I think the position that it comes from, which is people genuinely would like to not only make, you know, a steady return, but also have their values reflected. I think that's a positive societal shift in perspective. Um, whether that translates from what is a genuine demand from the public into um, sort of credible outcomes through the financial system is another question. So we have the question about ESG, you know, being greenwashing and the, the approach that most people have access to when it comes to ESG investing is you, you know, buy uh, into an ESG fund, which is, you know, going to be based on just adjusting your exposure to different industries based off of a mainstream index. And, you know, the amount that that translates into material differences in the behavior of companies in the real world is you know, I think a bit questionable. Um, we talk about greenwash from the narrow perspective of, you know, there's all sorts of articles about this green fund has fossil fuel companies in it. And for me, that's not really the big problem. For me, the real issue is that most ESG funds tend to be just chock full of, you know, tech and finance. And that's fine, but it's hard to argue that that's, you know, having a transformative impact on addressing the climate crisis. Many of the big tech companies have quite questionable, you know, human rights and governance issues. Um, um, and, you know, the Vanguard uh, flagship sort of S&P 500 based ESG fund, you know, its top five holdings are Amazon, Alphabet, Facebook, uh, you know, Tesla comes in at number six. So it's hard to say that that ESG fund is really having a material impact on, on the climate crisis. Um, and so I think it reflects what is a very positive change in social awareness and consciousness, but I don't necessarily think it's translating to material change like, in the real world, to put that in scare quotes. Okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. So I'm interested in what you've just said, is whether it's changed opinions. And I want to rerun that first poll that we did about whether ESG is mainly an exercise in greenwashing or not. Um, just, just let's, let's do that vote again. I, and maybe we'll get exactly the same number <laughs> that we got the first time around, but I'd be interested to see. 
While we do it, can I share my favorite ESG oh, yeah. anecdote? I mean, I don't like you. Because you guys could take it to the channel. It would probably be a lot better, actually. Uh, uh, yeah, so just that one of my favorite studies did an analysis of all the ESG funds available based off of the Russell 3000. And what they found by an order of magnitude, like 100 times greater than any uh, factor in terms of the difference between the ESG funds and the Russell 3000, was that it's selected for companies with no employees. Um, because if you have no employees, then you can't really have labor disputes. <laughs> so one or fewer employees was the single greatest indicator of whether you are in the ESG fund or not. And I think that sort of gets to the heart of this, right? Is this is about adjusting your exposure to these issues as an investor, but that's a very different thing than changing, you know, than directing investment in the real economy and then changing the way that companies are behaving and delivering capital to, you know, new upstart companies that might be in the renewable sector, for example. Adrian, I've got tell you, you are brilliant because um, the vote has changed quite substantially. <laughs> um, that you have had a big impact. So I think the first time we ran it, it was 17% that yes, it is an exercise in greenwashing, but overwhelmingly people said no. And now it's 35% say yes, it's greenwashing. <laughs> no has dropped 18 points to uh, 38%. An undecided 27%. So, um, who says debate doesn't change minds? <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, so, you've talked about the problems of greenwashing and the, the limitations of it. What are the solutions? How do we create a world where, you know, value isn't only associated with money? Oh, God, what a question. Um, well, I think, you know. I persuaded everyone. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess. There are two ways that I'll try to answer that question. And one of them is that as someone who works in the policy space, the concern I have about the sort of proliferation of the popularity of ESG and sustainable investing, as well as the kind of singular fixation with uh, pricing mechanisms as a policy solution uh, among, you know, not only the UK and US governments, the EU European uh, emissions trading system, for example, being the flagship, but also international institutions, you know, that is the default way that we think about this problem. And for me, I think, you know, those things are proving to be ineffective and that's a huge problem, obviously. And they also, I think, overlook a huge and very important part of this question, which is that the uncomfortable truth of climate and ecological crisis is that this is fundamentally a question of global distribution. You know, there was an incredible in-depth report in Bloomberg the other day about, uh, you know, the carbon footprints of the richest 1% of the global population. And the uncomfortable part about that is that that's people earning just over 100,000 US dollars. So we're, we tend to think of the top 1% of the population as being, you know, the Elon Musks of the world. But the reality is that many people in this room might be in that bracket. The top 10% of the global population of earners is 38,000 US dollars a year. So many people in this room, I imagine, in that bracket. Um, and, you know, the outsize impact, not only on carbon emissions, but also on uh, resource use, uh, that that cohort of people has is something that we unfortunately need to think about and address. And so when I think about value, uh, for me, it's, you know, thinking about realistically, our lifestyles are going to have to change, particularly among, you know, the richest people within the richest countries in the world. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be an inherently negative thing. I think we have this idea that that's inherently austere and anti-progress. But I think, you know, most of us, the true value in our lives comes from things that might actually not be priced, that might not be things that we engage with in an economic sense. And it's, you know, this sounds maybe a bit twee, but, you know, time with family and friends, access to nature and green spaces, having, you know, fundamental income security so that you can have access to all the basic things that you need to thrive. It's, you know, shared community spaces, access to arts and theater, all these things. So, you know, when we think about the way that our lives need to change to address these crises, um, it's to focus on the parts of our lives that we really, really value and, the, um, you know, to think about the ones that we could discard. You know, my freedom to consume feels great, but it's also predicated on, you know, the profound unfreedom of, you know, garment workers in Bangladesh and people who are picking through my recycling in massive containers in Myanmar and, you know, whether or not I can make changes in my life and whether or not policymakers can address this issue in a way uh, that 
grapples with the uncomfortable question of wealth inequality and that distribution is, I think, incredibly important. I've had to live to you now. I want you to tell your story. So in 2017, I have been at the FT all my working life. Um, absolutely. I, I, not quite all, but, you know, a couple of starter, dreary starter career in banking. But apart from that, if we forget about that. Um, so I had done um, 32 years at the FT for most of that time. I had been writing sarky columns about corporate life. Um, when I started writing about corporate bullshit, people said, oh, these are all quite funny, but you'll run out of subjects in a year or two, uh, whatever it was. Just on that column, 25 years later, I was still going strong because the great thing about corporate bullshit never stops, just goes on. In fact, actually, this whole thing about companies banging on about value is something that I would have taken to the cleaners in my old life. The sort of companies sort of saying, you know, we create value at every stage on the customer journey. You know, that sort of complete and utter nonsense. Well, as you can imagine, this was a job I got quite good at doing. It suited my sarcastic personality, which was why I did it for so long. But when I, you know, I had, I had a couple of sort of bereavements. My mum was a brilliant school teacher. She died when I was in my late 40s. And I suddenly thought, oh my God, I need to be my mum. I had wanted to be as, as, as little like as my mum as possible. I wanted to go into journalism. Why? Because I valued the status of it. I wouldn't have admitted that at the time, but journalism was such a cool thing to be doing. And in those days... Remember dinner parties? I don't know if any of you go to them. I don't know. No one's invited me to them for decades. But, um, but you know, it used to be so nice to be able to say to people, uh, you know, they always have, you know, boring question, what do you do? And then you say, I'm a columnist at the Financial Times. Everyone goes, wow. Um, and I love that. That was so, so good for my ego. But your ego, if it's being fed like that, by the time you're 57, if not a lot earlier, your ego is starting to feel a bit sick, actually. Your ego, your ego is not remotely impressed by you yourself. And I've, you know, I kind of said everything I had to say. And I thought, what on earth am I going to do now? And you're, you're almost too young for this, but just wait. You're probably not planning that next stage in your career, not just now. Nobody ever said to me that I would go on working probably into my mid-70s. So I did when my dad then died. When mum died, I thought, no, I'm too old at 47. Ten years later, when my dad died, I suddenly thought about it again. And I thought, I'm not too old. My daughter was by then a school teacher, and I knew how that they were in such short supply. And so I thought, I'm going to do this. And more than that, I'm going to set up this charity. So if we want to talk about it in value terms, what had motivated me in my 20s? I wanted to be glamorous. I wanted to be high status. By the time I was in my mid-50s, I thought I'd gone post-status. I didn't care at all about any of that. I also had made enough money. I owned my own house. I could afford, I took an enormous cut in salary. So by the time I'd added in all of the extra things I was doing, I was probably making about 150,000 at the end of my career. And my, and then I was making 25 at my new one. So that was really quite a large pay cut. But that was because I'd saved enough already. It wasn't because I was suddenly going to live very simply. So it's very important to realize that it was from a point of privilege that I did that. Um, but the value was my motivation was different. What did I really want? And my sister slightly patronizingly said to me, she's still a journalist, by the way. Yeah. She said to me, I suppose you want the luxury of being useful. Um, so... Is she, that, good relationship with I actually adore my sister, and that was why she dared say something as irritating. But she was absolutely right. That was what I wanted, and you know what? It's what I have. I'm five years into teaching, and the luxury of being useful, and yes, it is a luxury because I can jolly well afford it, although actually, I'll tell you, playground duty at 7 a.m. isn't all that luxurious when it's raining. We were just chatting before you all came in and the audience joined us. And you told me that you've got a new job and that you're moving and you're moving home. Do you want to elaborate? Okay, yeah. So once you, so I didn't change my life at all 
for 30 years. And then once you start doing it, you realize you can change all the time. It's quite exciting. It's quite fun, do different things. So I've been a Londoner my whole life and I've just moved to Newcastle. I don't know anyone in Newcastle. Um, it's completely random. I have got, I'm leaving my school in Tower Hamlets where I'm teaching entirely um, Bengali children. I'm moving to a Catholic school in a suburb of Newcastle. Um, so there we go. Do we need to talk about the vulgar money side of it? Yeah, no, you need to talk about the housing side. Of it. Okay, the housing side of it. So it's like getting blood from a stone. <laughs> she, thought she knew exactly what the question. Uh, Come on. I was going to make him ask. Um, so, yes, I have just bought a former bishop's palace outside Newcastle. <laughs> absolutely ginormous just listening to adrienne about the rich people and their carbon footprint i mean the heating bills we bought it before russia invaded ukraine it's absolutely massive it's you impossible to insulate because it's all listed and stuff it's going to be terrible so we're just going to wear a lot of jumpers right okay so so i want to get i want to get back to the sort of kind of value status kind of question because you, you clearly set up why you made this move and why you wanted to do what you wanted to do. But do you think that people have treated you differently? When, if you ever went to a dinner party, which you don't, but you met somebody and they say, what do you do? Yeah. And you say, teacher now, whereas before you said, colonist for the FT. Um, do people treat you differently? Yeah, I mean, this has not worked out as I expected at all. And I think there's a sad irony in this, that the status of teaching in this country is abysmally low, abysmally low. My young colleagues cannot believe what I've given up to become a teacher. My students can't believe what I've given up to become a teacher. That is a tragedy. But the weirdest thing, those very people who are going, ooh, columnist on the Financial Times, are now my age. And they are even more going, oh, teacher. And that's because at the very tip top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the search for meaning. And so if you're as old as me and you're saying, actually, I don't want that other stuff anymore what I want is meaning is I've now completely hit the jackpot and have the status too so very yeah so so that's very strange but the sad thing is that the status goes to um to people my age and the other now teachers just dropping in the name of my charity who um the 500 of us sort of relative oldies in the classroom all of their friends think this is amazing because actually the stories that you have to tell about a classroom are so much more interesting than uh the stories of what you get up to in the office right which leads us brilliantly to the next uh, poll question which is can value and status ever be separated Yes or no? That's an easy one. <laughs> Go, oh, you've got the result there, haven't you, on the screen? Is it on the screen? No, it's not. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm looking no, at it, no, no, expect something. No, don't look. I, oh. I want you to guess what you think it will be. Uh, everyone will say yes. 78% said yeah, yes. Yes, there we go. 22% no. Um, since you've done it, have you found a lot of other people who are kind of interested in going down this path that you've gone? Well, we've got... Um, 500 people have become teachers right. through through Now Teach, which is completely fantastic. Um, and so, yes, and I hope some of the people listening today will do the same thing. Uh, I'm going to take, um, we're going to come to audience questions later, but it's just, I'm going to weave the questions in now. Why do you think the status, uh, this is from Lucy, or no, maybe it's to Lucy, maybe it's from Lucy to Lucy, I don't know. <laughs> and why do you think the status of teaching is abysmally low? Yeah, it's a, I, oh God, why is it so low? Um, I don't really know. I mean, I think whoever said, um, you know, those, those who can't teach, um, I would really like to do something very nasty to them indeed. I, I, I think it's a long historic thing in this country, and I don't... Do you use this country? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's definitely this country. I mean, in, in, in other countries, um, it's as difficult to become a teacher as it is to become a doctor, and there's no actual reason why that shouldn't be the case. I mean, isn't teaching our children the most important thing 
that one can imagine doing. So, I mean, I think it is very, very bizarre. And I think it's a whole series of historic accidents. But then the question with value reasserts, or with money reasserts itself, that, you know, teachers are, are, are paid so little too. Um, and much, much, le- um, and, and, and the relative pay of teachers is lower in this country much than in others. Can I actually ask a question on that point? Yeah, I mean, everyone's taking yeah. out yeah. 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 Should we go have a drink? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because I was quite interested, I mean, your entire story is really incredibly compelling, but I think for a lot of young people, myself included, for a while still, um, you know, it's, I'd love to know, do you think you would have or could have made the same decision you did had you not, as you said, been in quite a comfortable financial position? Because I think a lot of young people face sort of this dichotomy where you have to choose something that might reflect, you know, your passion and what you want to do versus, you know, being the first generation in history to be worse off than our parents that, you know, many jobs being quite low paid. Um, and whether you think that is something that's just out of reach unless you have that financial security. No, it's obviously not out of reach in that most teachers, even in London, where property prices are astronomical, are still very, very young. Um, but I think, you know, I look at them and wonder how they are managing, you know, all living lots of people in a house renting a tiny little room. Um, and, and, and that's made very, very difficult. And it's extremely tempting to jack it in. I think what actually happens is that lots of people do want to be teachers. And then they go into the job. Um, and it's a combination of it being very, very hard work and very, very little money it means that half the teachers leave within five years. And that's an absolute disaster. Half. half leave them five years. What a disaster. Yeah. Let us come back to ESG. And someone sniggers as if that sounds boring. Are you saying that's boring? <laughs> you, you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, no names, no pad drill, lady in the green dress. Um, anyway, um, Simon and Adrian, is there a way to make ESG more meaningful, make it more purposeful? I mean, one of the most astonishing things, and the industry loves names and and uh, all sorts of ways to define things. Why do you? Why in people's minds are the E, S, and G equal weighted? To me, you want to talk about G. If you are doing good governance, the other stuff should follow. So I think there should be a much greater emphasis on: Is the company well managed? Is it doing the right things with plurality on its board? Is it you know? Start with the G. Make How do you know, more. by the way? Well, and if you and I've talked to emerging market managers who buy companies in the Philippines, and they say we can't track some of these. You know, it's just not possible. So that's the other big problem. So. By and large, the G would appear listening to people who are running companies to be a little bit more uh, visual because you can look at the boards and makeup, you can look at the employees, you can go to the factories or the workplaces and, and, and feel some of these things that are more readily identifiable. But it's far from perfect. I mean, I think that's a really interesting point. And Simon definitely has, you know, the upper hand here in terms of what is sage investment advice. So please disregard everything that I say from the perspective of investment advice. Um, and I think that's quite an interesting, interesting point. Um, for me, I guess, when it comes to um, whether or not ESG then translates into, for example, helping us to address the climate crisis, you can take a company like Shell or BP, which I think you could say are quite well managed. You know, they've got you know, quite robust governance systems, et cetera. But nonetheless, you know, publicly listed companies are sitting on three times the amount of fossil fuel reserves that we can burn to stay within a 1.5 degree Celsius limit and are continuing to explore for additional fossil fuel reserves. And that, as I think both ecologically disastrous, but also likely, you know, a financially questionable decision from the perspective of stranded asset risk, for example, some would argue. And so I wonder whether in terms of the material outcomes as opposed to, you know, benefits in terms of um, being a sound financial investment, whether governance always is is the key ticket there. Uh, Adrian, let me give you another audience question, uh, which reads, I completely understand your point of view about ESG, but is there a sense that radical change can't ever happen within these huge companies? Do they need to disappear before we can save the planet? By huge companies, do we mean Shell and BP? Is, that, is this coming uh, from I, I don't know. They, they may be from someone online, so I can't answer that question. Mm. So, well, let's imagine all sorts of companies. I mean, you know, defense contractors, I don't know, cereal producers, whatever. 
Sure. I mean, I think, you know, there are lots of good people with working within corporations that are agitating for change. But ultimately, you know, a Shell and a BP is continuing to produce fossil fuels and continuing to explore for more because they are motivated by what they view to be, you know, on different time horizons, a profitable pursuit. And so my perspective would be that ESG, I think, as I said, is a welcome kind of social shift in consciousness. But I consider it a potentially dangerous distraction from where I think in my view, people should be directing their energy, which is sort of demanding a much more robust regulatory framework and sort of government-based approach to regulating uh, carbon emissions, to regulating fossil fuels, um, and to not shy away from that being something that we need to be doing rather than thinking that, you know, it's it's enough to just be sort of making our own portfolios sustainable. Uh, I don't know whether you are so busy on playground duty at seven and then... <laughs> In marking people's maths papers uh, later on, that you don't have time to follow this debate. I kind of got a sneaky feeling that you do have a view on where it, what you've heard from Simon and Adrian. Yeah, actually, I did try and ban myself from reading the FT completely in my first days as a teacher to try and make the um, juxtaposition between the two worlds less intense. Actually, I used to be an energy correspondent. So in the dark ages before we thought about any of these things, there were companies that I knew very, very well. I think that if we suddenly say we can't have big companies where we're in a sort of fantasy land. I mean, we do have the big companies. They exist. We've got to look at this pragmatically. Um, maybe, you know, should they should they stop exploring for fossil fuels completely? I don't know. I think that these are arguments that you do need to put the numbers on them, probably to some extent. And going back to what you were saying earlier, Simon, which is that, you know, it's a matter of, it's, you know, it, 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 it's a matter of process. I mean, I'm amazed at how much, at least, least the lips in lip service, um, companies like BP and Shell have moved and are doing very much the point of um, the uh, Norwegian, yeah. what's his name again? Nikolai Tang. Yeah. yeah. So if Nikolai says it, I'm with Nikolai, basically. Okay. I guess that's what I'm saying. Um, that's really interesting. I, just a question to all of you on the panel. The environmental protest movement has been sort of characterised and personalised in the name of Greta Thunberg. The extraordinary campaign, but has she advanced the cause? Because it seems that, that you know it's just no to industry, and it's you know seeming to take an absolutist position, mm -hmm. which I, I think a lot of people that are working within companies might find unrealistic to just think, well, we're not going to do that anymore. And that that has actually, if you if you need cooperation between the environmental lobby and people who are you know. And, and, and business, that maybe that's not the right way to go about it. Is that broadly directed at me? Well, it's going to be directed <laughs> to all three of you, but I look at you first. <laughs> um, you know, I think actually it's quite, it's quite healthy when it comes to something that is as intensely political and as, you know, potentially catastrophic as what we're facing to have a little bit of antagonism. It may be, you know, that many people who work within the corporate space will find, as you said, what she advocates highly unrealistic. From her perspective, the idea that we can have a sort of smooth corporate-led response to a tremendous crisis, particularly from someone that is, you know, as young as she is, probably also seems quite unrealistic from the perspective of science. So I think it's okay to have what might be two highly antagonistic positions, and I don't think that's necessarily detrimental to the cause, provided that it has people talking and generating debate. I think debate is in and of itself always a good thing to have. And I think that, you know, had she been more gentle in her framing, she probably wouldn't have had, you know, the impact that she's had. Yeah, but people don't want to talk about the pensioners who rely on the dividends from these companies. They don't want to talk about the employees who are earning money and are doing a decent job at those firms. And what about when you want to take your child to the doctor and they're blocking the M25? So I think that, you know, protest in channel correctly is important for evolution and change. But back to your point and where I do disagree is to get through this energy transition. If you stop and BP and Shell are exploring, but the industry and aggregate has shut up CapEx. So they have not been investing. And this is why we have particular problems. Gas storage tanks have been shut down. These guys have not been able to get finance to continue to explore. And you have to get through this transition. This is not three or four years. To get from BP statistical review, 82% of you know, energy comes from hydrocarbons. Well, from 82% to 20 requires nuclear. It requires all sorts of, you know, 
progress because the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And so it's a little bit of smell the coffee, is my view. Do, do, you, think, do you think the business itself is going to deliver the, the change to the environment that it is needed? If you accept that there is a, a climate crisis, that the business will adapt of its own volition because it sees the validity, or does it need to kick up the backside? Look, I think protest and debate is absolutely essential for change, and I think it's happening. Talking to as many on as many as podcasts, we get to listen to really interesting people running businesses around the world, and I would say that almost without exception, there is a sense of urgency that was absent. So I absolutely acknowledge that that discussion, debate, you know, making things polemical, protest with a small p, you know, have their place. But, you know, we have to have, have functioning economies and we have to have global progress that allows those Bangladeshi workers to move up the pay scale and to enrich themselves. So the way in which you do it is not shutting down factories. Questions from the audience. Sir, uh, is there a microphone? Have you got a microphone? Uh, it's a question loosely related to what was just said, actually. So um, destruction of the natural world occurs you know, often in developing countries because people need to make money to, to feed themselves and their families. Um, when the, the value of preserving it would be far greater to the, to the global population, um, how do we incentivize that? I, I don't think, I mean, there's so many things that fall on the shoulders of poor teachers to teach their kids, not only what's on the wretched curriculum, but we're meant to be teaching character, we're meant to be teaching all sorts of our creativity, all sorts of other things. I think that's a policy. I think that is a policy question, not a child by child education question, particularly. Um, I mean, how would you, I, I can't see how you would weave that into what you're trying to teach them. I think that is more a policy question and a whole society change in how we value things um, that thank God I wouldn't see as teachers number one responsibility, but maybe that's just passing the buck. Do you, can I put it back to you? Do you see this as something? Um, you see all words, you know. <sighs> well, I knew she'd take over this session. <laughs> I think um, Gabon featured in the news very recently. Um, you know, got an enormous forest there that is of huge value to, yeah. to the world, to, to our, our atmosphere. Yeah. Um, and it, in developing countries, people might destroy that because they need to make money. So yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. Well, we're not going to stop people wanting to create money. I mean, this is more one for you, Simon. I mean, you know, people are, uh, especially people who don't have any, they are just going to want some. Um, that just seems to be a fact, and there's no amount of changing opinions that will that will change that. But maybe, um, as Adrienne says, maybe we will pull back from this desire to put a price on absolutely everything. And as the thought of cataclysm looms larger and larger and larger, it will be something that we will all in our uh, individual decisions value alongside, but I think we're a hell of a long way from that at the minute. I'm, I'm, uh, actually, I, I want to ask another question, but Adrian, I want to come back to you on that. Just, just, do you share that analysis that an awful, you know, yes, some young people are deeply, deeply concerned about the environment, but it's by no means all. Yeah, I actually really do. And I think um, it's one of the things that I find really concerning uh, coming out of, you know, a lot of politicians, for example, is this idea that like the kids are all right. And, you know, look at all these kids out on these student climate protests and isn't it wonderful and they're going to solve the problem. So I think that's a huge abdication of responsibility. But I also completely agree with your analysis and I, you know, don't have my own evidence for it. But anecdotally, it seems correct to me that, you know, the ability, the freedom to sort of have the luxury, frankly, to think about this as an issue um, is something Something that comes from not having immediate poverty and sort of income insecurity. Um, and I think this comes back to your question as well and back to maybe I'll, you know, I hammer on about it too much, but the uncomfortable reality of this, which is that, you know, the climate crisis is something that we're going to have to resolve by thinking about the way that we distribute the tremendous amount of wealth that exists in this world. And right now it's done in a way that is unbelievably unequal and that creates desperation that creates you know insecurity in a way that you can't necessarily engage with all sorts of issues um and so by giving people you know much more uh basic security in their lives i think we can you know address a lot of those issues now maybe that's politically naive um but it's where i think you know the crux of the issue lies which is in just radically and unjustifiably unequal distributions 
We've only got a few minutes left, and there's an audience question which has come in online. And it's a little bit broad, but you're each going to get a kind of minute or so each to answer it. Can we change societal values? Can we shift society from caring about money so much? So first of all, I don't think we should view money as bad. Money is neutral. Money, just to go back to my bossy economist's point, money is what happens when you have um, allow a buyer and a seller to put a price on something. Um, I think it's 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 absolutely fine. You've you know you've got to have money in 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 an economy. So I, I would disagree with the implied idea in that that we need to move away from money. I don't think we do. I think we need to look at how that money is distributed, which is a diff completely different point. I think that um, we need a more equal distribution of money. Um, and once we have that, then maybe we can start to, um, to think about other things. Can societies change? Well, of course they can. They do all the time. Societies change in what they, in what they value absolutely massively. It happens without anyone's agency at all. It just is one of those sort of weird things. And we all often change in the same way. I don't think that you can change values by telling people to change. I think we change as a response of, to things that are happening in the world. Well, there are two questions, aren't there? Can you change the societal values? Of course, we see it witnessed. A regime, generations review things, do things differently. Um, can we change society from caring about money so much? I worry when I hear the term distribution of income because it smacks of sort of, you know, uh, what did Churchill say? The Labour believed in the, uh, in the queue, the Conservatives believed in the ladder. I think there's a little bit of people want to get richer. They should not be, um, you know, uh, frowned upon for that aspiration. It is about, you know, progress. I think that the touch of hypocrisy of the West telling in developing countries that they need to not cut down forests and the rest of it is an awkward one because they can turn around and say, well, you've already made it. So I think the West has to accept that they need to be leaders in this and others will hopefully follow. But I think that, you know, we don't make progress, you know, in the broader economic context that allows other progress unless capitalism thrives. Final thoughts on that same question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess my slightly um, cynical perspective on it would be that uh, I would like to think that we will change the way that we think about what we value in, in time to address ecological crisis. But I think realistically, probably it's going to come to a point where, as Lucy said, conditions change such that we are forced to reconsider things. And I think we're, you know, rapidly approaching that kind of, of a future. And that's probably what's going to prompt a major kind of reevaluation of the way that we, that we work and the way that we produce and the way that we distribute. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. Right. My final question to each of you is I want to know some one thing that you value deeply that you can't put a price on. Love for your children. I'd go along with that. I'm not pausing because I wonder whether I go along with that. Of course I blink and go along with that. <laughs> I mean, we all go along with that. You know, if, but I'm trying to think of something um, surprising. <laughs> um, that... Yeah, my train was on time today. You don't put a price on that particularly, so I've already bought the ticket. I mean, look, that's at its most that that you know that's at its most mundane level. I actually think that the things that we really do value, um, price doesn't got much to do with it at all. I mean, you stole my answer, so I guess I will just say uh, whales. Oh, hot. <laughs> <sighs> Or even prime ministers who tell the truth. Oh, no, I, oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't go. No, I did not go. Listen, all of you, thank you very much indeed for being part of this. I hope this is the start of a conversation, not the end of one. Thank you to Whitey for putting this on uh, for another uh, stimulating debate. But for now, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.